we're going to move to um, a panel discussion. So uh, as part of this discussion, uh, we're going to again focus on government as a catalyst uh, and for catalyzing health data. Uh, I am pleased to introduce Simi Singh, the moderator. Uh, she's head of the healthcare services and digital health practice at Egan Zender. Simi is also a lifelong student of history, human health, and public policy. She's a nationally known innovator um, and technology entrepreneur, having served in a range of governance, advisory, and operating roles over the course of her 20 years. Um, I, she has also been a tremendous advisor to the Health Data Consortium, and I now consider Simi to be a close personal friend. So with that, I'm happy to introduce Simi Singh to the podium. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, good afternoon. I'm not coffee, but I'm going to try to be close. Um, it's fantastic to be here. Um, I always love being at 1871. It just, you know, you think of Water Tower and the Chicago Fire and everything that this city um, and my wonderful home of Chicago represents. So for those of you who don't have the pleasure of living here, welcome to the state of Illinois and to Chicago. It's fantastic to have you here today. And I'm very privileged to uh, invite up my fellow panelists for a wonderful discussion. So if you'll join me um, on stage, that'll be fantastic. Wonderful. Well, um, Damon, Kerr, Shell, and Wilma, welcome to, uh, to join me. We are going to have a very interactive um, fireside chat. I'm not Charlie Rose, but that's the style we'll be following. Um, I do admire the way he can facilitate a conversation. Um, I've had the pleasure, actually, of getting to know many of uh, my fellow panelists here. And there's just a tremendous amount of information and insights and stories to talk about. So I'll introduce each one of these leaders to you. You have their bios. I'll introduce them as I ask them questions along the way, as opposed to in serial narrative. Um, and so perhaps the first uh, leader that I'm going to start with is you, Shell, if I could. Um, so Shell, as you can see, is the Chief Deputy Director of the Office of Systems Integration uh, for Health and Human Services in the great state of California. Um, although that said, Shell sort of started her career as an economist. She has a master's in economics. And she's really, through the course of a career, been kind of the quintessential polymath, um, specializing in a number of different professions. So she teaches uh, in, as faculty in the state of Arizona. She's been the commander of the California Highway Patrol. She has worked uh, with health and human services. Uh, she's had leadership roles uh, in addressing the impact of toxic substances. And she's been an entrepreneur. Um, so with that introduction, um, I wanted to perhaps, Shell, have you start with this wonderful uh, conversation that we had where you sort of put the human in health and human services, isn't it? Because we've been talking a lot about the health component today. And we'd be interested in what are you learning about the role of data and innovation in the role that you play today? Thank you for that uh, fabulous introduction, um, some of which I can correct later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't run the highway control, but, <laughs> uh, but I did work there. Um, I, I think that from this last presentation, we heard from Dr. Putin that there is a strong community component and there is a strong uh, social component to wellness. And uh, so, so at our agency, which is, which is the uh, Health and Human Services Agency for California, uh, we have both sides of that coin. And, um, and, and there's an increasing importance on the human services side of, of the equation as it relates to healthcare. So it's, uh, for example, on the example that Dr. Wooten used for Charlie, uh, Charlie's depressed. He's had a, uh, you know, a number of life events that maybe have led to that depression, but um, it's impossible for Charlie, or appears impossible for Charlie, to get out of that depression on his own. And that has a direct health impact for Charlie, but it, it's clearly a social dimension that we're addressing there. So I, I think as we look at this, uh, this notion of um, of health, we have to think about it in terms of, of human services as well, of the social aspects and the, uh, um, the community aspects. Um, I don't know, how many people do we have here from New York besides Daniel? Um, so uh, evidently in New York City a number of years ago, not too many years ago, 
um, New York City had a uh, policy where they would not um, let the foster parents know that a foster infant, foster child infant that they were about to take into their home had HIV. So how would you expect that foster parent to care for that infant and know what to do um, if that infant uh, you know, started having events? How would you expect that foster parent to protect themselves and their family? Um, that kind of data or information could not be shared because of a policy. Um, and uh, you know, recently, uh, I think those uh, those of us in the audience who know anything about uh, FERPA, um, recently the FERPA laws were changed so that foster parents could know that uh, their foster children were not going to school. Um, again, these are data elements that have not been shared with the people who's who is who are entrusted with the very care of the clients uh, that need the care. <coughs> but can't receive that data because uh, someone is trying to protect that individual's privacy and confidentiality. And I'm not saying that we can't or shouldn't protect privacy and confidentiality. I'm saying we should do that where it makes sense. Um, and we should share things where it makes sense to share them. Um, so what we've been looking at at Health and Human Services Agency is how can we share as much as makes sense for the care of, of the individual or for the, the well-being of the individual. And, and where do those um, points of intersection occur? Uh, you know, how, who's making those decisions about privacy and confidentiality? And what we're finding is, you know, it's often an individual just like you or the person sitting next to you who has interpreted a statute in a particular way and yet someone in a neighboring county or someone in a neighboring state has interpreted it slightly differently. So uh, you know they're, they're not hard and fast rules, and, uh, and, and a lot of what is needed here is education and awareness around um, you know what can and should be done. That's wonderful. Thank you, Shell. And I think one of the other stories that struck me when we had spoken uh, was that. Um, um, so one of the other stories that struck me when we had spoken was when I'm, and I correct me if I get this wrong, but you were sort of talking about. Um, you know, foster children and the fact that the judge had to approve the administration of psychotropic drugs. And in fact, if you think about it, right, here's a judge approving the administration of a drug. He or she is not a physician, and they don't really have access to the medical record. So I think this recurring theme of tear the walls down to a higher purpose, sort of in the service of great questions, is a really, really interesting one. And I think the huge role that where the public and the private sector can kind of come together as human beings to do the right thing. Um, so with that, Herb, if I could next uh, introduce you and kind of bring you into our discussion. Um, I often think of people as sort of, you know, those who live kind of on islands and others who live on bridges between them. Um, and I think many of you are very interdisciplinary in that sense. And Herb, you sort of a board certified bridge dweller because you're kind of used to this whole customer relationship, uh, you know, and the customer centric view to be an entrepreneur, to be a policymaker, to come in you know, kind of as a firefighter into troubled situations across, uh, including with the Illinois prison system, as we'll talk about. Um, it struck me in the conversation with you, Herb, you sort of said, you know, the silos have been around since Lyndon Johnson in 1964, and, um, and it's, you know, in some senses, right, and that, that, that there's been a reason why all these walls were erected in the first place, and as many of you know, President Johnson in 1964 started many programs, right, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the Head Start program, and that kind of thing. Um, and then in a talk that you had given, you also quoted uh, a confirmation hearing, which I thought was fantastic, uh, an anecdote, which was I think President Eisenhower invited Charlie Wilson, uh, who would you know, run GM to be Secretary of Defense, and he was asked at this confirmation hearings as to uh, whether or not he would make a decision uh, as the Secretary of Defense that would be against the interest of General Motors. Um, and his response was a tentative sort of affirmatory response because he knew the answer had to be yes. But he said, I have thought for years that what was good for General Motors is good for America. And um, it's interesting, isn't it? It's been a long 60 years uh, since, uh, and an eventful 60 years. And I was wondering, Herb, if you would talk about, uh, as you lived on this bridge between public and private, what are some of the initiatives you've been working on and what are you learning about bringing us together? Um, well, uh, the most interesting thing I think I've learned is that people are people, 
uh, and that people are good. Um, but when it comes to social engineering, people can sometimes become a little twisted. <laughs> and so the challenge is being able to take the good in people uh, and turn that structurally into something that actually uh, changes things. So today, I, I come from the commercial sector. I've only been in, in, uh, in government service about four years. I had the uh, blessing to be able to actually take the time to be able to do that. And holy smokes, uh, what an incredible arena. Um, I had an opinion about uh, government workers uh, prior to doing government service. Uh, which has significantly changed the point where I'll fight anybody in a bar if they badmouth a federal worker or a state worker or a local worker. Uh, because these people do incredible things. Uh, they're on the front lines, just like first responders on a daily basis. And the vast majority of people show up every day to do the right thing for people. The problem is, is that the structures that exist um, in, the, in government are really no different uh, than in multinational corporations where from an IT perspective, if you do a merger and acquisition, uh, what you're trying to do is to meld uh, five different uh, IT systems or ERP systems, which are on, on different versions. And so what that translates into is the inability to get to the data, uh, one, and two, people protecting their data because of the rules and regulations uh, that, uh, that Michelle mentioned. So what I found that is most successful uh, is to be able to appeal to the greater good or the common good of what it is that people are attempting uh, to do. Um, people have very, very limited views, not their own fault about uh, where they are. So in Illinois recently, I've been working for the last couple of months with a thing called the Framework. Uh, it's a very unique project. Uh, may not seem unique to you from everything that we've discussed here in terms of what technology can provide. But since the Johnson administration, uh, all of the programs which we consider to be human services programs, oh, and that dirty word which we called welfare a long time ago, as all of those programs developed in Illinois, it turned into seven, eight, nine different departments. So if you want to get a single view of an individual in the state of Illinois who's being serviced by more than one program, you're probably touching the majority of those nine agencies. Think about that just for a second. Let me give you the next number. 17% um, of the people who receive health and human services from these agencies represent 58% of the state budget for health and human services. And as you know, in most states in the United States, more than 60% of state budgets are um, uh, health and human services. But, you know, that's fascinating, right? I mean, speaking of numbers, uh, one of the things that I was thinking about, I mean, it, you know, in the private sector, right, of frequent flyers, they get the most attention. I, I live on a plane out of O'Hare and I store my family in the suburbs, but, but I, you know, I get treated like royalty, like my neighbors wonder if I'm the cleaning lady, but when I get to O'Hare, I get to go to flagship check-in and I'm a goddess on American Airlines. And I think that, that what's really fascinating is you know, you gave me a really interesting statistic or a story about a project that you were working on with the prison population, and I sort of, being a curious cat, kind of Googled and figured out that the Illinois prison system is supposed to hold approximately 33,000 prisoners. It has, as of a statistic that I was able to gain from about 12 months ago, it was running at an all-time high of 49,000 occupants. Which then led me to wonder, well, how big is that, right, in the context of kind of the services industry? And I discovered that Chicago very proudly in our Olympic bid stated that we had 101,000 hotel rooms, right, in this three, four, and five star category. Um, and so I thought, well, I wonder what it would be like to run all of the hotels in Chicago, you know, or half of the hotels in Chicago at 150% occupancy with the systems that we have, right? But of course, I mean, you know, those are meant for frequent flyers. They're not meant for prisoners. But you differ. Tell me about that. Well, uh, simply what, what, uh, what happened is, is that uh, I was lucky to come in uh, to state government uh, just about the time, for those of you who live in Illinois, you may recall this uh, uh, several years ago, uh, where our current governor woke up one morning to headlines, including in the New York Times, um, that were not very positive. Uh, because about 2,000 prisoners had been released a few days earlier around uh, between Thanksgiving and, and uh, end of year holidays. Um, and unfortunately, a significant number of those people went out and 
um, pillaged and done all other things uh, that uh, quickly uh, forced them to be put back uh, into prison. So as this became a, uh, uh, both a, a social policy issue, a criminal justice issue, uh, a political issue, um, I was, uh, unbeknownst to myself, and being very naive, was dragged in and said, I told, fix this. And I said, well, wait a minute. This is really about policies and the way people make decisions. Um, and they said, no, it's the computers. It's the computer's fault those people got, uh, got released. So I went and looked at these computers. And in fact, uh, there was a mainframe system where all the data was kept, uh, the majority of the data was kept, which had been turned on, the button had been turned on to run the system uh, to manage the prisoners uh, when Bill Cosby and Roseanne Barr were the most popular TV programs. <laughs> then there were another set of about 40 uh, applications and databases uh, that had been built uh, sometime uh, in, the, uh, in the early, uh, mid-1990s. And when anyone needed to make a decision about a prisoner, a simple decision, it required days and sometimes weeks to be able to actually physically assemble all of that data. We're talking about data, right? But it took that amount of time to be able to deliver, to pull it together. So long story short, I, they were, I was told, fix it. Uh, and I looked at what tools I had available to myself. Um, and I took a very interesting approach. I took a prisoner-centric approach or a person-centric approach. Uh, let me stress that uh, I want to make an important point. This is a technical decision not a bleeding heart decision. Uh, what I mean by that is, is that it's not a feel good idea. It's actually an approach to, uh, to information and, and managing data. And the architecture uh, and hierarchical approach to building around an individual becomes very, very powerful when you begin to think about it. So what I did is I took a customer relationship management system, which we're all probably familiar with, which is used for managing uh, the sales to a customer. Uh, and I built a prisoner management system. And then I went to all of the bosses, and they wanted to fire me because these are criminals. What do you mean treat them like a customer? And I said, well, you're, they're, they're your customer. You deal with them every day. Uh, and so you should be able to aggregate the data about these individuals on a regular basis and make good decisions. So the final point about this is, is that in this context, what we're doing at the framework of uh, uh, addressing health and human services is we're not out, out to automate the decision making and have technology make the decisions. We want human beings to make the decisions. And the old idea of IT, of computer science, was decision support. Somewhere along the way, uh, the promises of artificial intelligence kind of confuse that. The whole point is to aggregate data about people so that people who are good make good decisions. The net result was that in three years we moved off the mainframe. I can happily report that all the data that's in corrections is now in the cloud outside of uh, O'Hare Airport uh, initially. And more than 60% of the decision making now is done with only about 150 data elements of the 15,000 that were the, inside of the old system. That's what we're hoping to do in the future with the Frameworks Health and Human Services uh, uh, initiative that we're doing right now. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And it's it's a great, great story. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, so Dr. Wooden, we, it was fantastic to hear your uh, presentation. I was really pleased um, to, uh, to hear the story of everything that you've been accomplishing in San Diego. So for those of you, uh, you were wonderful. You talked a lot about your county and not about yourself, so I'll brag about you a little bit, um, at least from what I, I know. But you started your career at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, in terms of your education training, worked your way through uh, Hopkins, Georgetown, and then uh, into the county of San Diego. And what impressed me, you know, your background in kind of sports medicine and preventive medicine really kind of comes through in the approaches that you've used in the county. Um, and I was wondering perhaps if You've walked us through the what and the why in this very evocative fashion, right? I mean, our future depends on it. Our, our, our children are our future. Um, tell us about the how. You know, to, to Herb's point and to, to Shell's point about, you know, being able to make the right decisions. Do you have the information that you need? Well, that, that's a great question. And unfortunately, I didn't have the time to talk about another component of Live Well San Diego, which is our knowledge integration project which actually speaks to the keynote speakers, uh, what he shared with us about taking information. What we're doing is we have over 750,000 clients within the agency, but they come in at different points. And if they go to 
child welfare services, and then that child uh, maybe might intersect in another program. There's no communication between those programs, so there's a duplication of effort. So the Knowledge Integration Project is looking at no matter where you come into the system, as an individual comes in, there are standardized uh, variables that are populated. If they come in one system and that information is already in the, the demographic information, it will automatically pop up if they go to another program. And the program will also help um, with predictive analysis. It might even make referrals. Charlie, for instance, if he comes into the system uh, and we know that, God forbid, he may have had an STD. Uh, some information, again, information is uh, allowable to be shared based on who's allowed to review it. But at least at, when they come into different systems, there are some referrals that can be made that will pop up for that individual, the worker that's uh, taking the information uh, for that patient at that given point in time. And as we collect this data, it will also help our agency executives uh, make decisions about a population of of, of clients. So we can also uh, have some predictive analysis uh, around the data that uh, we are collecting on our uh, client population as well. Fantastic. Um, well, that's, um, you know, I, I, I love sort of learning through stories because I think what's really interesting is to be able to, you know, take the, the headlines that people talk about and look at the wonderful examples of where uh, interdisciplinary collaborations have been created in government. And that brings us to you, Damon. I mean, you've been trained in business. I've had the, the pleasure and privilege of being a colleague of yours briefly at, at HHS as well. Um, and you've been, you've taken on a number of different roles, I think, as you've been inside uh, government after your business training. Um, obviously, at ONC, you uh, manage the Blue Button community. And I'd love for you to, you know, Brian wonderfully talked about the impact of that project, but I'd love for you to share for those who don't know what Blue Button has accomplished. It's a tremendous, tremendous project. Um, but I'd also, you know, you, you work in consumer e-health, and I perhaps thought we would talk about that a little bit, you know, access, action, attitude. You talk about sort of the three A's and what those mean. Um, but I, I perhaps would start with the fact that, you know, there's so much discussion nowadays, obviously, about CMS, right? But to think about it, this is an over trillion dollar agency. There are uh, 18 different agencies, in fact, inside of HHS. And there's some really exciting and interesting work going on between the agencies. And so if you want to pick one of those topics and kind of either consumer or a blue button, I'd love for you to talk about an interdisciplinary example or two. Sure, sure. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> Pardon me. So um, yes, I've spent time at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. Uh, I worked in our consumer e-health program for quite a while, and I was there at a time when we adopted the Blue Butt program from the Department of Veterans Administration. Um, it was a really interesting time because, uh, as you all know, interesting was there was not really any substantial funding for the consumer e-health piece. And that turned out to be an interesting challenge. We had to sort of beg, borrow, and steal to create programs that were going to incentivize consumer e-health types of initiatives. Um, but all of that in recognition of the fact that the consumers that all of us are attempting to serve are really at the cross of what it is that we want to get to, is having an engaged patient um, be as knowledgeable as possible about their own health such that they can then be an equal contributor towards that health as they live their life, 99% of their life outside of their provider um, visit, that they are actually able to be as knowledgeable as possible, as we alluded to before. Um, so it's been a really exciting time at Blue Button, and I will tell you that there are some really exciting announcements coming um, with regard to Blue Button and its proliferation into some major organizations that you all know very well. So the idea that an individual will be able to get um, their own vast troves of data from the places where they interact with the healthcare system and human services systems is going to be really exciting. My new role now is in Brian Sivak's office and the Chief Technology Officer's office where I work on our Open Health Data Initiative. And so this is an initiative that's across the entire department. And just to provide a little bit of perspective on what that means, the department is comprised of nearly 20 agencies. And so many of them are ones that you're familiar with, Food and Drug Administration, 
Centers for Medicare Medicaid Services, National Institutes of Health. They are major, major organizations that have a ton of data. And so the goal really has been now, as we've said earlier, to start to strategize the methodology for which we can bring that data to all of you for some of the really interesting and creative things that you are um, able to do. Uh, one thing that I would, I would love to sort of reiterate that Brian stated first thing this morning is, we want to hear more about what it is that you need out of the data and what it is that you're doing with the data. Um, we have a question, uh, excuse me, an idea section on our healthdata.gov blog where we, you guys can submit what it is that you're actually interested in getting from the department. And I'll tell you an example of how well that has worked. Uh, recently we got an email into the uh, idea tab on the healthdata.gov blog that came to me and someone had requested some information about the Office of Civil Rights. I was able to quickly send an email, walk down the hallway, and through a quick conversation I was able to have that data set in a link within a couple of weeks with additional information about other data assets that we're going to be able to liberate. So I, I would encourage you, if there's stuff that you're working on that you're not seeing data for, send us some information about what it is that you're trying to get and we can try to obtain it for you. Uh, but I want to hit on another point that Simi raised, which is the sort of cross-collaborative piece of data within the Department of Health and Human Services. Now, we've been trying to figure out both ways that we can infuse data into the various places that you're doing your work, but we also want to make sure that the data assets and resources that we have are being used inside the department. We are all doing health and healthcare human services related things, and some of us have data that we need to contribute to each other. And I'll tell you a quick example of that. I was recently at a meeting with uh, CMS colleagues who had invited folks from CDC up to have a discussion about their various data stores. The goal of that discussion was really to try to figure out how to increase the ability to do surveillance for, from a CDC perspective. So as you can imagine, CDC is constantly looking at um, surveillance, prevention, and all kinds of other measures as tasked by what the off that office does. But Medicare data is incredibly important in terms of what it gives in terms of insights as to what actually happened in a clinical visit. So you can start to glean data from the claims that are brought in through CMS, <laughs> one billion claims a year, and you can start to help that be an augmenting source of data towards CDC surveillance initiatives. So you can see that we're trying to look for all of those different ways that we can cross-collaborate on the data that we have across many of our different um, our different agencies. So it's a really exciting time, and I encourage you to get involved in, in any way possible so that you can help us to understand how we could do things better from that perspective. So that's a that's a wonderful example, and it's sort of you know to to speak to the thirst and the demand for that kind of information. I've loved a recent story about bugs and drugs. How many of you have heard about that app? Not many. Okay, one there. That's great. So it was put out by Athena Health and, uh, and Hippocrates. It's shot up to being the number one app, 100,000 plus downloads in its first few weeks um, in the, uh, you know, at the App Store. What does it do, right? What it basically does is mines a lot of the data that they have of the 40,000 plus physicians that they serve and looks for the superbugs that are emerging sort of across the country, right? And, and kind of allows physicians at the point of care to look at the patterns in their particular geography in their own patient population and figure out whether or not they're using the right arsenal of antibiotics, right? And, and the demand for it by physicians moving that to their mobile platforms, and it's estimated that certainly, you know, probably 80 plus physicians right now have either, the, either an iPhone or an iPad, just kind of shows, you know, in, a, in one small example, how many different ways there are to actually be able to use information at the point of decision making to truly impact the care that we're delivering. And what, of course, that might do to retard instead of encourage the emergence of supervisors. Um, so it's been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I wanted to open up for questions uh, with the audience for the time that we have left. So uh, you're welcome to chip in with thoughts and ideas and questions for the panel, please. Oh, come on. We weren't that good. <laughs> All right. Hi, this question is for Dr. Wooden. Your presentation was awesome. Um, and my question to you is, I heard you mention Board of Directors a lot. So I wanted to find out if you can break um, in three tiers who your target audience is for your website. So like tier one, I don't know, Board of Directors, or either your, um, your citizens, and in tier two, just the top three audiences. The, the website is for the general public. So the general public, 
and as well as our partners. So any individual, whether you are an individual, whether you are a family, a parent, or if you are a business or an organization, you can go into the uh, website and find out what you can do to help improve the health of the global health of San Diego, of the San Diego community. Fantastic. And what I mentioned, I, I mentioned our board of supervisors, which is the governing body for the county. So they have the authority to tell us what to do, basically. So we are implementing, but the vision started out with our agency director and spread to all of, to include all of the other business groups uh, within the county and then spread to the entire county, our uh, community stakeholders involvement. Right. Well, won't that be interesting, right? You have, I think, 3.1 million inhabitants, if you will, in your county. It'll be interesting to see if, in the Internet Without Walls, how much your site has an impact and spreads virally um, across the country and, and indeed the world. Other questions and comments? Please. Sure. Uh, you really, uh, um, it's fantastic. I love how you use the CRM system for um, uh, prison customers. I'm wondering if you also extended that line of thinking into gamifying certain aspects of how to, I don't know, um, improve prisoner outcomes. Uh, interesting. Okay, so I'll try to do this really quick. Uh, no, uh, nowhere near that innovative, uh, but I get the idea of gamification uh, and the importance of it. Uh, from the perspective of, of education and actually really engaging the individual to understand and learn. So there's no question uh, that there that, that is uh, there needs to be uh, an important initiative uh, in, in that direction. Let me jump to something similar that maybe may be helpful. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, do the caveat, which is I'm speaking as an individual, uh, not as an employee of the state of Illinois, so I don't get into too much trouble from the people that are here. Uh, but the, I, I mentioned before social engineering and social policy. Uh, technology today allows you to control down to the field level a piece of information. So there's no problem with deciding what someone, who sees it and how much of what someone sees. That's a very important thing that we need to understand. Getting there from a policy standpoint is, is going to be a, a, a difficult challenge. But we could do so much with data to be able to make people's lives better. Give you a little example. Uh, combining the private sector with government, uh, since you already have a social policy about how people spend their money when they receive social services, the link card in, in Illinois, what's wrong with a peapot approach to making sure uh, to their benefit and, 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 uh, and, and, and opt in that they're getting delivered food to their home in the food deserts uh, where they, where many of this population lives, right? Um, and doing that could be done from a, from from the standpoint of educating on the front end. There's a company I'm probably, they're probably not even uh, represented here uh, called Jelly Vision uh, that I've been, that I've been looking at. If you're all familiar with it, it's a very good. Are you from Jelly Vision? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> so, but the, the the basic point of of what it is, it's a gamification approach to just getting someone to answer a series of questions with a machine but you actually feel that you're dealing with a human being. And what it does is it leads you down and then then an else a process, a branching process of decision making, which then provides you information or directs you to the place where you're going to go. There's so many technologies out there. The data is already out there. There's so many business models that are all out there. The problem is, is bringing all of those people into the same room to problem solve from that perspective. I have a comment to add to that as well. Um, I just recently, I don't know if anybody knows what Duolingo is, right? It's a game to learn a different language and you can you know, choose whatever language you want to learn and, and it's gamified. So it's, you know, it does actually, it is fun and you, just, and you do it. But when you mentioned gamification in the correction sense, I, I, I sort of snickered to myself um, and thought, well, in, in the corrections environment, I would be, I would be totally surprised if those people, you know, they had a hard enough time thinking about their prisoners as customers in a CRM sense, and you know, giving them games to play, I, I just don't, I, I don't know if that would ever be something that they would think about, but they might. But I think that, the, you know, as, as, as Herb said, and as Dr. Wooten mentioned, in the 10-year initiative for um, Livewell San Diego, 
the game needs to be part of the leadership team. They need to, to, to play the games about you know what happens when you don't share this data uh, for the benefit of your client. You know, if a client falls over, little X's in the eyes, and game over. Um, that's where the gamification needs to come in, I think, is at the leadership level. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I think uh, one last question, and then some closing comments. Uh, just a little background. Blue Button, I just, uh, I'm not familiar with that program, just maybe a little Sure. Um, so the Blue Button program is basically an initiative that was started with the Department of Veterans Affairs before it was moved over to the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, the background story is that, as you probably know, veterans traverse the healthcare system in many different ways. Some of them are constantly in the health, in the VA system, but oftentimes are required to go out of the health care system that the VA provides to um, private providers. And what ends up happening is with a myriad of comorbidities and other things, you end up pulling records from all different kinds of places. And so you end up with this classic care coordination issue. And there are literally examples of, you know, dutiful wives who are assisting their husband with a crate of massive papers that they're literally trying to, to carry the knowledge from person to person in order to facilitate you know, their, their spouse's better care. And so the idea was that if the VA could allow the quick and easy download of your butt, of your data, and literally in a meeting where this was idealized, so, uh, where the ideation happened, someone said, couldn't you just click a blue button and be able to download your data? And that was sort of the genesis of how that was born. Um, it really created sort of a movement in consumer e-health access to your, your personal records. And so, um, in recognition of the ONC's vision for adopting electronic health records involving consumers in their health to be partners, um, it was recognized that the VA really could port this over to ONC to really carry it forward. And so what you're starting to see from a blue button perspective is um, many electronic health records providers, uh, vendors are starting to put the blue button functionality into their electronic health records such that individuals can log into the portal and get their data. Um, you're going to start to see it in more con um, uh, commercial outlets where folks are in engaging with health, say um, their local pharmacy or what have you. And so it, it, Blue Button is not a product, you can't hold it, um, but it is sort of a, a set of standards and processes that qualify as being categorized as Blue Button, but we needed to make sure that there was actually a continuation of this branding so that if an individual starts to hear about Blue Button, they, they actually can walk in and ask for something. You don't want to walk in as a patient and say, can I have access to my record based on the standards of blah, blah, blah. You need to be able to say something really quick and easy and be able to look for something really quick and easy on the portal. So that's the general idea behind Blue Button, is, that is the movement towards that standardization of an individual being able to capture their record, port it along um, to different places, and, and really be the mediator of their own uh, health data exchange. Right, and from what I understand, there's already been millions of downloads. Millions. Millions, millions of downloads. Millions, I mean, millions, you know, yes. in fact, so many of us whose parents perhaps are in the Medicare program don't know about Blue Button, and we right. should, um, which is fantastic. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll perhaps close as I, you know, sitting here looking at Kaveh, who's been inspiring me for, uh, for decades ah. since he was two. Um, but, but the, um, but you know, one of the things Kaveh said in his presentation, which I thought was very evocative, is that the digital world is coming to help, whether we like it or not. And I think one of the, and, and we do like it, um, but, but part of that, right, which is something that, that you talk about often, is that we really are moving to a world where care, even the delivery of healthcare, is becoming less personal, yes, but it's becoming ideally more personalized. And what's really interesting is that it seems to me that saying holds true for the world of information as well, because if we are looking at the world's most giant level of table of contents, we're having more conversations with the internet than we are with each other looking for information. And wouldn't it be wonderful if so much of what we're looking for continues to get rapidly more personalized, which of course you know, raises this big, big dialogue that we're all having in our country as we realize that the angry birds are actually hungry birds and they're taking all of our information and that, that, that Google, you know, as they drive by to kind of make sure they have a picture for for their maps application actually takes passwords and stuff uh, while they drive by. Um, and so there is this giant policy human battle that we're uh, having today between big brother and big data. Um, and may I suggest that uh, big heart and big intellect win. So with that, thank you. Join me in thanking my colleagues.
Thank you, Simi, for the expert facilitation and to, the, uh, to all the members of the panel. Um, I have to say that it is, uh, it is entirely encouraging to see, um, to see leaders in government taking point, driving, uh, driving some things that may probably, my, I have to think a few years ago, some of these felt odd. It's impossible for me, it's not impossible. Um, I think for anybody to sort of think three or four years ago that we'd have a thousand data sets up on the web would have been laughable. Seriously, what has been achieved in the last couple of years is absolutely stunning, and I congratulate everybody that's really making that happen. Um, next up, we have uh, we're going to introduce you to uh, Steve Ellsworth. This is a slight change, not in the topic, but in the delivery mechanism um, on the agenda. Uh, Steve has more than 20 years of client services experience. Steve is with a company called Socrata. Socrata is uh, one of the breakout tools helping these and others take data and make it available for the public. 